All right, we're going to go ahead and get things kicked off today. Once again, thank you for attending today's webinar entitled Sitefinity Plus Test Studio, Better Websites, Faster Launches. A couple of housekeeping items to go through real quick. All callers are muted throughout the call, but please feel free to submit questions or comments in the questions panel or the chat panel. And uh, we'll have a follow-up blog post with all the popular questions and answers, as well as uh, a, a link to the recordings. We will be recording today's session as well. First, by way of introduction, my name is Andy Wheeland. I'm a senior sales engineer for Test Studio and a certified Scrum Master. I've been working with Telerik in progress for about four and a half years. And first of all, I want to start with the end, basically, what most people look to get out of test automation. Uh, so a lot of our customers come to us initially trying to get away from either a manual process or what we refer to as a bloated coded process for test automation. And what they hope to achieve is this sort of post-automation day in the life, where you essentially can start your day with email results or results uh, of your test list via email that have been automatically sent to you, uh, possibly from test lists that have been running overnight or over the weekends or, so, or something like that. And this actually allows you to focus on what's failing instead of what's, uh, what's working. And that's the catch-22 of the QA world, where if you spend 30 minutes trying to prove something works and it does, it's as if you just wasted that time because you didn't find any failure. So Test Studio really turns that around and lets you review that failure information and go to what's not working in the application so you don't have to waste your time. Uh, you'll see in the foreground here the failure details. We'll be taking a look at that along the way as we create some tests. Also, we have a great integration for uh, bug tracking tools to be able to submit bugs directly into the development process. And this really empowers the QA to be more agile and to be more of a participant in the application lifecycle as well. This also creates a feedback loop, not just the buzzword that everybody likes to throw around, but an actual feedback loop. And it empowers, again, the QA team. They can simply report bugs, review things, uh, review test failure details, see if it's a test issue, see if it's an application issue. And this allows them to then communicate it back into the team with integrations to different bug tracking tools here, uh, as well as custom integration if you, de if you do need to uh, create a, a bug tracking integration beyond what's in the list there. We also have test list scheduling. We've got uh, a lot of data that's captured at the point of failure that you're going to see too, and this can all be uh, also integrated into continuous integration processes and build servers uh, like Jenkins. The other big benefit here on failure details is we, we love to get failure details from our customers because we do have a great support team. It's engineer level support. It's 24 hour guaranteed response time support. So when you have a, te a test that's failing, you have the option to get help from the development staff it's a, if it's an application issue, or zip it and attach it to a support ticket and get help from our support if it's a test issue or if it's something you need help with on Test Studio. Now Test Studio takes a different approach to test creation and test maintenance that you're going to see today. First of all, we have four solutions to every problem. This means as you're creating a test, if it doesn't work one way, you've got three other options to make it work. And three out of these four are codeless options. So ultimately, we try to reduce code as much as possible so that our developers can spend time on creating features rather than test maintenance. And our QAs can have more uh, capability and uh, be part of the process, be more involved, and also be able to maintain the tests uh, rather than relying on, on our development resources. So the first of these solutions is point-click recorder. We'll hit record, we'll do what a user does, we'll capture all the actions and elements along the way. And if that doesn't work, we can invoke our uh, build a step in our toolbar. As you can see, here's an example of uh, creating an image verification, which we'll also play with today too. Uh, still a codeless process. If that doesn't work, we can use location-based interactions or XY coordinates, which is where a lot of other tools live. Any, any tool that's using XPath, for example, is simply finding something by a location, really guessing that uh, something is in the right location, whereas Test Studio approaches this very differently. But that is an option. And then if that doesn't work, you can code it in C Sharp or VB.net. You have the ability to really work with uh, so it looks like we have maybe a little bit of an audio hitch, but I think we're coming in clear now. So ultimately, 
four ways in which you can create. Up, do we? Are we still losing audio? We may may be having a little bit of audio trouble here. Only for some. Okay. All right. So four different solutions to basically solve every problem in, in creating that test. This also gives us the ability to reuse. And the theme throughout Test Studio is reuse. So when you capture an element, which may be a button, a, an input, um, a checkbox, uh, a grid, we basically will recognize that, store it globally across the project, and reuse it, create new references to it uh, along the way if, if you need to uh, use it in another test. This allows you to update a broken or changed element and apply it across all of the tests. Our tests can be evolved very, very easily rather than being thrown away and starting over all the time. We also can, of course, record a test in one browser and run it across four other browsers. So five browsers uh, total that we can execute against. Uh, and that comes by way of our sophisticated find logic, which you'll see next. We also have the ability to modify a base URL setting and, and hit different deployments of the application. So when you finish getting everything ready on your Sitefinity sites in staging and you promote it to production, you can actually rerun the same list of tests against production to make sure that everything did translate over correctly in that final, final change there. Also test a step, you'll see this in action too. Test within other tests. Why you know, reinvent the wheel? You can just reuse what, uh, what works for you. So if you've got a common function like logging into an application, you can simply just reuse that rather than uh, recreating it every time. And also we'll take a quick look at load testing today, but performance and load testing are included in Test Studio Ultimate, and you can certainly just reuse your functional test, your functional regression test that you create as performance test to see where the bottlenecks are in your application, and inside of our load test to see what capacities your test uh, or your uh, servers can handle. Also just ease of use, copy and paste capability throughout, which makes it easy to work with. Under the hood, this is what we call the Corvette engine of Test Studio, the ability to locate elements in a way that's responsive, in a way that's sophisticated. We locate elements, as you can see in the example in the background here, uh, locating a login button by the fact that it says the word login on the button. That's how users work. So we can do that, but we can also locate things by ID or maybe an href or all sorts of other attributes of the elements that don't tie it to a location. You also do have the ability to use location-based identifiers, but they are at the bottom of the list for a reason. They're weaker identifiers. They're subject to uh, breaking easily when things change. And things can change from browser to browser. This is why our tests work across browser, because this logic doesn't change from browser to browser. If it says login in uh, IE, it should say login in Chrome, right? You'll also see an example later where I can data drive text content when I'm using it as an attribute, and actually run the same test in multiple languages. Now at the project level, you can see here where we can prioritize the attributes to create a backup search as well. So Test Studio, and this is completely customizable for what type of application you're working with. So Test Studio can look for automation IDs, unique IDs, uh, labels and buttons, or, or text within rows for dynamic grids and things like that. Uh, and move on down the list to the weaker and weaker uh, attributes and tags. So this is something that can, can, you can custom tailor for your sites to make sure that Test Studio knows best how to work with your application and provides a backup method when the best method uh, doesn't work. So a lot of times you'll have a, if you do have a failing test, it'll be a failure with suggestions. The ability to create chain find expressions, you'll see an example here uh, in a couple slides where we talk about that. And also, of course, the ability to fix these elements codelessly uh, and apply it across the entire project. A couple other items on, on codeless test maintenance. You get uh, a toolbar that gives you a lot of power to add verifications in. There's actually some specific verifications to our Teleric controls, which Siphonity is chock full of. So you can get uh, some added benefits just by using this within Siphonity. Uh, you can see an example of some Kendo specific, Kendo grid specific ones. But we also work with third-party custom controls, really any web application we can work with. Uh, so you can easily add verifications on the fly with the element highlighter. You can edit elements against the live UI to make sure it's working correctly and working right. You can 
create very advanced things like elements, element, and drag and drops were my favorite things because when elements change, because you've got a responsive design application, when it renders down to a different size or form factor, those elements move. And if you're trying to rely on X, Y coordinates and X paths, that's not going to work. With, with the way we approach it, with our smart, sophisticated file logic, we can go find element A, go find element B, and always make the right connection in a drag and drop scenario. So that's a really powerful capability that you get, again, from our codeless capabilities. Here you can see an example of an uh, element that's been changed and applying that change across all of the tests that use that element, so that reuse in action. So a lot of things here to help you keep the test codeless, right? Minimizing the need for code when, when needed. Now here's more about the dynamic grid situation because a lot of people will say, well, we don't believe that this is true, right? We've been burned by test automation in the past that made promises like this. It's, it's true. You can see for yourself, and we've got some great videos as well if you'd like to check those out that go into a tutorial on how to do this. But basically, we can consistently locate specific records within dynamic grid situations. So you can handle grids that are sorted, filtered, paged, and uh, basically rather than using an X path, we can use a chain find expression, as we call it, that can locate the grid itself, the row within the grid, with maybe a partial contains operator on an inner text, and then ultimately the edit button, in this case, that belongs to that particular row. Uh, so this is very challenging to do. It's almost really impossible to do this with location-based identifiers. Um, so this will really give you a lot more precision and power in your testing we can use a combination of location and content if you want to as well. So we can make sure something's in the right cell of a grid, for example. Or we can go find it no matter which cell it's in. Or we can even page through that grid and find it on different pages as well. We can even data drive this. I can data drive this one component of this fine logic and actually create a loop out of that as well that would say, okay, now go to another row and click its edit button. Then another row and click its edit button. So a lot of very strong capabilities that we've uh, built in for that. Now behind all this we have the Test Studio licensing where you might have ultimate licenses to create and maintain tests. That's where your QAs are living all day. And then you've got your uh, runtime licenses that give you a Swiss Army knife to the test environment. You can create test scheduling uh, servers, you can create execution agents, you can have performance monitoring and profiling uh, with the runtime. So the runtimes bring together a lot of components. They're very inexpensive and they're a great way to build out your test lab so that you can make sure you can cover all the versions of all the browsers and things that you need to test. And you can have that all running while you're asleep. This is brought to you, of course, by Progress. And, of course, it comes along with the support that we're known for. And as you can see as an example here, just on the help tab within Test Studio, you have access to forums and videos and white papers and blogs and training and roadmaps and all sorts of stuff to get you what you need. We've got a great community behind all our products and of course Test Studio is included in that. So you can certainly go out into the forums and, and help and share and find solutions with, uh, with coworkers and, and co-users, I should say. Uh, but also you've got the ability to, to ask for help from support. So again, having that support is critical to making sure you get success. And of course, if you need additional help, we've got training options and professional services uh, along the way too. So we're gonna jump over now to Test Studio. And I'll give you a little bit of a tour around here real quick. What we're looking at is a test open in the test tab in the middle here. Uh, on the left, we have our project organized and this project is actually uh, synchronized with TFS. Uh, you can see here source control options. We do integrate our source control options with Git as well as TFS. And this, again, promotes collaboration. We're storing the tests where the code is stored. We're basically living in the same world as the development team uh, and providing a lot of rich data into that process. We can check in. We can check out. We have chain of custody. We have versioning. We have uh, conflict resolution that comes with that as well. In addition, you can see some integration points for Team Pulse project management or Quality Center if you're still using that, uh, as well as bug tracking options too. Team, Team Foundation Server again, JIRA as well. This allows us to create that feedback loop. And as I mentioned, there's great documentation you can get to just by clicking the link at the bottom here uh, if you need to create a custom bug tracking plugin. 
I would also encourage you to check out the forums as somebody may have already done the hard work for you. Test Studio's got lots of settings to customize and fit with each environment. We'd be always happy to help you get the most out of yours. Uh, if you need help when configuring your uh, fine logic strategy and things like that, you absolutely uh, have help along the way with that as well. So lots of things to make it work best for the application under test. Uh, also throughout the, the environment here, I've got an element repository. I've got an output. You can see here I've just committed something to source control. It gave me some uh, feedback on that a compiler, some syntax errors down here. I'm actually going to pin this one out of the way. And here we have the element repository with the page level and the element level. Also, whatever I'm clicking on and focusing on, we'll see the properties for that in the properties panel. And at the top right, we've got the step builder. And of course, you can move these panels around, pin them back, pop them out. We've got some custom uh, or some presets up here too if you'd like to uh, you know, move your panels to a sort of preset area as well. So next up, we're going to go ahead and start with creating our first test. And this is going to be just a registration test. So we'll go ahead and say create on that. Oops, I missed one thing there. I have my filter turned on, and I forgot to give it the right name, so I'll do that again. Because we want to call this the quantum reservation, or registration test. Now, for those of you that are familiar, uh, You've probably seen Quantum before. It is a great example site of uh, Sitefinity. There we go. And from here, what I'm going to do is just right click on this and choose record. So this is a great way to just jump in and get started. We're going to hit record. This is going to give me three different options. I can create my test in one of these three browsers or all three of these browsers. You can mix and match. You're not stuck with anything. This allows you to go get what you need to put a test together that ultimately will be able to execute across all three of these as well as Edge and Safari. Those two we don't record in, but you'll see those in the execution list in a moment. So I'm going to start out with IE here. My apologies. I am actually going to start out with Chrome just to switch things up. So. We'll do that again. There we go. So here's my recording browser. This is my starting screen, and this is the same starting screen you'll see on uh, IE Chrome or Firefox. And essentially now I can just provide the URL to uh, wherever I, uh, it is I need to go. So we'll drop that in. We'll hit start recording. And now we're in that solution one, the hit record, do what a user does, and Test Studio will capture it for you. You can see in the background here, it's already captured my navigate step for me. And as my start wakes, uh, my site starts to wake up here. You can also see it's attached the recorder at the bottom, the recording toolbar. It shows us we're in the live record mode. Uh, while I'm here, I'm just going to hit the highlighter real quick and add a verification. Oh, it went away a little bit too quickly, but we can actually add uh, verifications and timing adjustments. So if I have that startup screen there, I could actually have it wait for that to go away, essentially. Go. So really, at this point, whatever I uh, type in will be captured. So I'll turn off my element highlighter. Uh, we're just going to start by registering, so we'll click register. Now you will see that it's capturing keyboard presses too, so if I do jump from field to field, so for instance, if I put in tester here, and I tab to the last name field, it will capture that. Now a lot of tools will use tab keys and keyboard actions like this to cheat. And test Studio doesn't actually need that. Uh, everything is built into the test step itself. So when I have enter guy in the, in the last name field, we have everything we need to go find that field and populate the uh, data within it. So the tab key actually becomes an extra step. And any extra step you can eliminate. You can either toggle it off if you don't know whether you need it or not and run the test without it. Or if you know you don't need it, you can just delete it. And you can edit this test while you're recording. You're encouraged to stay in a live record mode and edit things and, and modify things and even run things back. You'll see from my right-click menu, I can run to a certain spot of the test, from a certain spot, or even selected steps you know, on the fly as well. Oops. 
And again, I hit my tab key. But we'll continue on here. Add in the email, the username, and of course the password. Perfect. So as I'm capturing all these test steps, I'm also capturing the corresponding elements. Down here at the bottom, and just by clicking on a particular test step, you'll see it highlight the corresponding element for you. So you get a really nice connection between element and step. We can also right click on this, go see where it's being used. This is currently just being used by this one particular test. We could even right click this and edit the element against the live UI itself. So this pulls up the, ver the values that are currently being used to identify the element and shows me other options that are here as well. So when we have something like a dynamic ID, for instance, we might trim this and basically just leave behind the static portion that makes the most sense. In this case, username, for instance. Now this happens to be a static ID. It just looks dynamic. But if it was a dynamic ID, this is one way to work with it. To continue to allow Test Studio to find the appropriate element and the appropriate field, but ignoring the dynamic portion of the ID and focusing on that static portion that's there. So we're looking for an input that contains this particular username ID. The other thing that you're getting is when you click validate, you'll see on the actual live UI itself that it's highlighting the field. So you have that feedback from the application itself in addition to uh, this message here that says yes, we're able to find that. So it's very easy to get in and update and troubleshoot and fix an element and even dive deep into uh, an element's logic like that while we're in the live record mode and even be able to right click and say let's go ahead and run this selected step right back on the application while we're here so we don't have to start the test all over again to see if we just fix the thing that's broken. And you can see that it executed that and passed. So it's very easy to create these tests. Now what I'm going to do is actually hop out of Chrome and we're going to just run this test now to the last step. I'm going to use now run to here. And the way to use this is just to jump into the middle of the test. If you need to edit something or troubleshoot something or update something or add on to your test, you can use run to here to get to any point you need to. It's going to execute the test up to that point, including that point, and then attach the recorder. So we started recording this in Chrome. Now I'm going to go finish recording it in IE. So as you can see, it goes pretty quickly through the process, fills out all those fields for me, attaches the recorder. We're now back in a live record mode and we can continue building this test. Let me go ahead and push this around a little bit so you can see what's happening in the background here still. And I'm going to just click register. Now, of course, every test needs proof, right? Especially if you want these tests to be able to run while you're asleep. So we need something here because right now, I can actually put any combination of data together and click submit. It's what happens after I do that. That's what tells me if I've succeeded or not. And here's a perfect example where it says success. We've got that figured out, right? Well, this is where I can turn on the element highlighter and I can cruise around and see all of the different elements and layers that make up the page. You can see when our custom translators kick in and recognize a specific Kendo tree node, for example, or Kendo menu item right, with great additional bonus features here, as well as the basics, right, so we, we will do the same for all uh, elements, whether they're custom or third party or what have you, uh, but when it comes to our own, you'll get some added advantages, and we can see how things are set without actually having to exercise them in many cases, right. So we can add verifications in like that, but for proof, I want more of a functional verification, which is perfect for the success message. I'll just float over that and under quick steps, we have verified text contains success. We can go ahead and use that as the proof. If we've succeeded, we should get that message, right? Now, this orientation one is important, but it's not necessarily mission critical, right? So I don't want it to ruin my functional test case. Uh, I do want to know if it's broken though. So what I'm going to do is set this to a continue on failure option. 
which you can see just gives me that icon there. So this way, this can fail if the orientation is vertical instead of horizontal, but I can still see if my registration process succeeds. It will still go on to this final verification for me. Right. So let's go ahead and uh, close our browser. That ends the recording process for us. Oops, not that. That's the wrong uh, X button. There we go. And we'll just run this back. And when we go to execute, now I've got the five options. So let's go ahead and execute this one in Safari, for example. So Safari is going to come up, and now I have my full registration test. You'll see it fly through that. And at the end of everything, it looks like we did have a failure at the end. Now I'm going to run that back and slow things down, but before I do, let's take advantage of the fact that we've got a failure details here. Now every time you execute a test, you do get a log file that's produced. And currently we're using what we call quick execution. This is a temporary set of data. It's still valuable and I can still act upon it, but it's temporary. If I rerun the test in quick execution mode, we'll get new data. But this tells me every, a lot of what I need to know, what browser and version we're running against, all the steps that passed, the step that failed, a little bit about the failure detail here as well, and um, the total time it took to run that, which was four, under four and a half seconds to execute that entire test. Now, let me go ahead and run that again, but this time with our annotations turned on so you can really see what's happening on a step-by-step -step basis. Annotations are going to highlight for us each of the elements along the way. It's going to basically show us uh, sort of a play-by-play, -play, if you will. Also at the bottom right, you'll be able to see what's happening on a step level as well. And you can pause execution if you need to inspect something or grab screenshots and things like that. So this is a great way to inspect you know, what was happening. Now one thing I didn't show you was the failure details uh, that come out of this as well, but we'll probably have the same failure this time, I suspect. So jumping into this red X, double clicking on this, will give us the full failure details. Now even though this is a temporary result, again, I can still act on it. So if we find bugs during test creation, we could still submit them, which is a common need, of course. Here you can see that we're trying to match the, the text contained success. Uh, it says it can find that, didn't match. We also have images that show us the expected state on the right and the failed state on the left. So we can capture and compare what we expected to happen and what actually happened. We have the page DOM at the point of failure too, so we can inspect what was going on behind the scenes when that failure occurred, and the ability to fix the failure if it's a test issue. In this case, it's, it's uh, going to give us a, the ability to maybe switch out which um, type of attribute we're looking at, maybe different operators if we need to, or even customize or update the text that it's looking for. Depending on the type of failure, the Resolve Failure tab will look much different. If it's a failure to find an element, for example, we'll be able to fix that problem. Back on the Failure tab here, we also have the link to the complete test log again. And that time it took us 28 and a half seconds with the uh, annotations turned on. Um, but we've got the complete test log as well as an exception log. So all this data is captured automatically for you at the point of failure and allows you as a QA or as the developer to review it, determine if it's an uh, application issue or a test issue, determine if it's something you can fix or something you need help with, and then from here we can easily copy paste it to clipboard or export it to a zip file, or we can just hit submit bug and pump this directly into our bug tracking system. It populates the name and description for us and attaches the failure details. So I hit submit, it goes to my developers and they get all of that particular data, all of the uh, attachments for the images, the expected state, the failed state, the steps to reproduce the issue within the complete test log, and all that. And I get a little bit of feedback here from TFS letting me know that I just created bug 22. Right? Similarly, if it's a test issue, if you need help from our own staff, from support, hit export, zip it up, attach it to a support ticket. Our guys love to get failure details because they know they're going to get a lot of that data that's going to help them help you. So what's going on here, and it's a little bit tough to see possibly on the uh, screenshot there, 
but uh, I have already used up the uniqueness within this test, so I need to provide something unique again. My username, for example, uh, and email address need to change for this test to uh, operate correctly. Now, we certainly can data drive things, and I have some great ways to go get random data and populate them into these tests as well, if you're interested in those. But uh, what I'm going to do real quick is just update these two and see if we can't get a pass out of this. So we'll execute that back one more time. We'll stick with Safari for consistency. And hopefully we get a pass. Now when it comes to verifications, there are both functional that tell us whether we're succeeding or not, like is 2 plus 2 equal to 4, or you know, is it, does it say success at the end when we get to the end of this process, or does it say log out after we log in, for example. So there's lots of different types of functional verifications that provide proof, and then there's more of the superficial verifications uh, that provide us the stylistics, the things that tell us whether or not it looks the way it should, the human eye kind of variable. So it looks like we got a pass on that, everything uh, passed that time around. So let's jump into another test. Uh, I'm going to show you a quick login test now that we have got a couple of logins that have been created here. This is a basic test, navigates to a site, clicks the login link, provides the credentials, which by the way, if you need to, you can certainly encrypt. We do have the ability here to uh, take a password, for example, like my super secret password here and actually uh, either encrypt, which automatically checks is password, or you can separately check is password, which can be undone. As soon as I use encrypt, though, it's a one-way operation. You can now not encrypt, uh, de-encrypt that, uh, unless you're a pretty good hacker, I guess. <laughs> but uh, basically, that's all now been protected data, so we don't have to share secret information through, uh, through our tests, essentially. Uh, so basic login test, we have... Uh, a few different things along the way. We'll go ahead and run this real quick just to see that it's uh, working correctly. And I'll just use this as a chance to try out another browser. So let's go hit Edge here with this simple login test. The reason I want to run this one real quick is so that we can build on top of it. Once you create a building block like a simple login test like this, you can certainly achieve a lot. You know, you can basically start uh, all of your other tests with A, log in, B, go do something else. You can just use this login test as that A portion of it. I also might data drive this login test to show different uh, sets of credentials and, and what happens when they log in as well. And I see I have the in inappropriate uh, username there. But that's an easy fix. Here you can see the, uh, the feedback as well. So great to be able to see that with your annotations turned on. But if I didn't, if I wasn't present for this, I could review that failure details again and see what, what it was that went on. This time you can see it's a failure to locate an element. So it's looking for uh, a div that contains the text content of hello tester 13. It couldn't find that. Keep in mind if I hadn't had this verification at the end that I would have gotten a false positive. So it's important to have verifications throughout your test. In fact, you may even want to have even more verifications than this one at the very end. This time the resolve failure option gives me the ability to fix a broken element. And guess what? It's come with suggestions. This is when an application, or sorry, an element has changed, uh, and Test Studio will kick in the backup methods. So it was looking for the element based off its text content and tag name combined. It couldn't find that, right? What it brought back in this case was login button, login text, you know, all these different kind of things that correspond to to login. So we didn't exactly get there. We can see from the images that we didn't get to that particular spot. And this is where it was looking for log out, I believe, instead of log in. So nice try. This wasn't the solution, but it uh, gives me lots of data that I can share with the team and report back if need be. Now I'm going to try just taking the tester guy, uh, or changing this to tester guy 4 here. And we'll rerun that. and we'll see if we've got a pass. Once you've got your test working the way you want, we'll drop it in the test list, we'll set it up on a schedule, or, or call it from a continuous integration process, and uh, basically have it just run 
as often as you need to to make sure everything's working for you. Now I'll show you an example once we get a clean run of this how we can data drive this as well. Oops, I got a trial message there. And I didn't update my text, did I? But we can data drive the text entry of the uh, of the test itself. So the username, the password. Uh, we can also data drive the uh, find logic or the even the verifications that are involved. So there's an easy way to do that. We can essentially take our test. Uh, let's see, what we have it here. Jumping back to the project menu, you can see that you can bring in different data sources, Excel, CSV, XML, or even a live database, and attach that to your project level. As you can see, I've got quite a few already in here, a couple SQL databases, uh, as well as some different spreadsheets. And you can edit those as well as needed, and of course, uh, update those into source control too, and, and check those in and check them out along the way too. Um, so now that I've got a couple of those already in, I'm just going to choose my test, click bind test, choose my data source, and choose my table. And we'll go ahead and take a look at what's uh, what's in this one here. It looks like there's a, a number of different uh, options, 10 different records. I can filter these down. Maybe I want to get this test working for uh, just two records to begin with. So I'll go ahead and filter these down and see if it's working for these two. Oh, we'll give it three, I suppose. You also have further column level filters as well. So this is really useful, especially when you're doing a, a, a database data source. You'll pick your table or you'll provide a query, but then even after you do that, you still have some additional column level filters uh, to fine tune your data set. Once I'm ready, I'll click bind. This will then change the icon indicating that there's data on this test. And now at the test step level, I can go to the bindings properties, and in the drop-down, I have all of the uh, columns of data. So for the username, see this is the username one, so we'll just click username column, we'll hit that to set, and I now have a data-driven test that will iterate three times since I've told it to use three records. So we've got a username, password's actually the same in this case, so I don't have to worry too much about that. We're going to click login, and then we're going to verify that it says, hello tester, Right, but I need to update this as well, so I'll go ahead and data drive this verification to include the username. And we'll just modify this to say contains and pull off the uh, hello part of that. It'll actually insert, it doesn't really matter what's in there because it will actually insert the uh, value from the data driven portion of it. So now we can execute this test. I'm going to turn off annotation for this so it goes a little bit quicker. I don't think we've hit Firefox yet, so we'll go execute against that one. Now here in a moment, we're going to go take a look at load testing as well. After we get a little bit further here. Now Test Studio uses timeouts. You can see at the very, very bottom, it's counting down right now as it's waiting for the uh, verification to complete. Timeouts are great because we can go as quickly as the application allows, but allow for an, uh, an amount of time before we give up. So you can modify this at a step level, at a test level, at a test list level as well. So a lot of timing adjustments that really allow you to make sure that the test doesn't outpace the application. Now I suspect I might have three failures after this because it looks like they've all had the uh, incorrect combination being used there. But that's okay. With the iterative test, you'll see the iteration results up here. And we can drill down into each of those and see the failure details of those. This one seems to be common across all of the uh, different iterations which is a result of me providing some bad data, essentially. But once we have our login test the way we'd like, once we go to create another test, for instance, if I start up another one here, we'll say uh, product search, for example. Uh, sorry, I have my quantum filter on.
quantum product search. There we go. We'll just go ahead and jump in. Instead of hitting record this time, I'm going to hit open. And I'm going to start using my step builder. The step builder allows you to provide a lot of steps, a lot of common things that you might need, things like clearing a browser cache or maximizing the browser or adding delays, even jumping in the code things if you'd like to. And by the way, any of our test steps, you can simply right click on and edit in code. But the, the thing I'm going to use this for first is test to step, which is one of our most popular features. The ability for me to go grab a test that I've been working with and, uh, and just pull it into this particular test. Now, before I do that, I want to just double check that I have the right one here. That should work. So test is step. And you can see there's quite a few of uh, my tests. You also, of course, have the same filtering capabilities that you might want along the way. We'll grab this quantum login test, select that, and now we have a dynamic call to go execute the login process and then whatever else it is I want to build on top of that. So a great way to continue from here is to simply right click on the test to step, use run to here, and this will execute the test through the login process and attach the recorder, leaving me right at a spot where I can continue building on this and reusing that one common login function. This also achieves that cut down of maintenance or the reduction of maintenance where if I have a problem with my login test, I can go to one place and fix it for everything that uses it. And please feel free, if you do have questions that are popping up in your mind or comments, please feel free to, to add those into the questions panel along the way. Be happy to, to get answers for you, uh, if not during the session, at least in follow-up on our blog. But as you can see, I am in a live record mode now. The recorder is attached. Whatever I might do is uh, going to be simply added on to this test. So let's say we want to, first of all, take care of some cosmetic verifications. Let's make sure that those human eye types of things are working correctly. So to do that, again, I'm going to toggle on my element highlighter. We can go up and see that things are showing up correctly, that things are enabled. If we need timing adjustments, we can add a wait, which is a 30-second timeout to say does it uh, you know make sure something goes away before I try the next step or make sure something's visible or exists also we can use extraction which allows us to actually grab data from the live UI creating a runtime variable that we might data drive something else with which is great for uh, unique variables that pop up along the way here in the quick steps we'll just do a verify text contains on that uh, I'll make sure that this uh, pre-order button is enabled and uh, let's see, we'll jump up to this quantum image here. And let's do an image verification. Now you'll notice in the quick steps there's lots of options. There's JavaScript events that we can fire against it. There's mouse actions, some of the more difficult ones that you can easily set up, like right click or hover over, double click, scroll actions. And then you've got a couple other options here which invoke the toolbar. So if I do the build step option, it invokes this toolbar, which I'm now going to undock. And basically, this is another level. This is a little bit more advanced capability where I don't have to code still, but as you can see, when I click around through the DOM here, it will highlight the corresponding element for me. And over here on the right, I have different verification options and actions as well. So if we can't simply hit record and do what a user does, here's a nice, more advanced way of creating an action or interaction uh, against a specific element and, and making sure that we're working on the the appropriate layer. There may be sometimes buttons on top of buttons and things, so this really helps you see those and, and work with the appropriate one. Also, this is where you're going to find element to element drag and drop. But I'm going to jump over to the verifications here. You can have some of your basic verifications, but then also some of those more cosmetic things. You know, let's make sure it's got the appropriate href. Uh, on the stylistic side, we can look at either computed or inline. And we can drill down and look at font, color, background, display options, text options. You know, for a responsive design application, for example, we might uh, check to see if it's it, how the alignment is, and and to make sure it says auto, right? Or to uh, check the width or the height of things. Now, as I make selections here, you'll see that it automatically populates the value for that. So if I go back to width, for example, this is the current width of that particular element. So you've got that live feedback and the ability to just say add that step without having to know to plug in those values. 
So lots of different uh, verification options that you can create, but also image verification. And this is really nice. This is pixel level image verification. Very uh, precise. Uh, we do, of course, provide a threshold because there is some sort of uh, variability, especially when you go from one browser to the next. And this is also a case where I might make a browser specific step like an IE image verification versus a Firefox one. So I'm basically saying I want to go find this image and make sure that it has all of its pixels in the right place and they're the right color within a 10% threshold, right? So that 90% of these pixels have to match what I recorded against versus what I execute against. Now right now I have verify entire image, but we can also just go in and draw an area. You'll see the XY coordinates are being used. And this is that third level that I mentioned before coding things. XY coordinates are used very uh, effectively with Test Studio because this still goes to the idea of finding the quantum image wherever it exists. And the zero, zero point of it is the top left corner, not the entire page. So when you are using XY coordinates, you're typically doing that based off of finding an, el an element where it exists uh, at execution and then offsetting from you know, the top left corner of that element or the center of that element to a specific spot. And that gives you a lot more um, accuracy throughout. So we'll add this one in too. So there's lots of tools here. We'll go ahead and dock the toolbar back and we can continue recording or we could even just go back and try running from here, for example, and just see how these test steps execute on the fly. And we also support uh, the execution or the uh, automation of dialog handlers for log on, like Windows authentication, for example, or download, upload, even generic ones. These are automatically detected during the recording phase, but uh, you can always add them in, drop them in if need be as well. Also, conditional logic, if else, while loop, loop options. There's all sorts of great things that we've got just built in out of the box for you. Uh, I want to say that I've got an admin test here that might have an if-else. One of these tests, I believe, has an if-else in it. But uh, really easy to drop those in and use those as well. I'm going to pull back my filter here real quick. Oh, I did just see it. Okay. I want to show you another test here, which is the language test. Because this one actually takes it a step further. It has a data-driven URL, so I can run the same test against different sites. Uh, it has data-driven verifications. And under the hood, it has data-driven uh, find logic. So let me take you through a real quick glance at what this shop link element looks like from the element find logic. Because what I've done is I've taken the initial uh, structure of how I'm locating it, which is by text content, and I've given it a value. I've got a drop down here to choose different columns to actually feed into the element find logic. So this is a very, very uh, dynamic thing to do, very complex thing to do, but again, a way in which we're doing that codelessly too. My data in this case is uh, attached from an Excel spreadsheet, but you also could build a local data set within the test itself. Uh, I should also show too along the way that Storyboard is capturing images uh, during your recording process, and that's actually where uh, the expected state comes from. Oops, sorry, I clicked on that. It went back real quick. So this is all the expected states that uh, were captured during the recording originally. Uh, but my data source itself is coming from an Excel spreadsheet, and in this Excel spreadsheet, uh, I have the English and the Spanish version of these words. So this one particular test, we can execute across different languages. And in fact, really it's a different site because they're two different URLs. So let's go ahead and run this real quick, and then I'm going to take you over to load testing to show you that as well. But while I'm working on that, I want to talk about the conditional logic a little bit. The if-else capabilities give you a lot of ability to take your tests, maybe modularize them. You might have subtests within your else and if statements as well. Uh, but here you can also see the verifications working out through the layers, by the way, with the element uh, annotations turned on. 
and this test has a lot of verifications built in. But again, with the conditional file logic, you can really start to branch things out. You know, if I log in as an admin, can I do what an admin should be able to do? Maybe go down that road. Else, go down the road of the end user experience. You can put together the different roles and data drive those. This also has a mouse hover over on this, so it hovers over that. Now it's switched into Spanish. A couple of these buttons, like login and search, are still in English, but it's going to go through the same test now, the same verifications now on the Spanish version of the site. And of course, if I ran this without annotation, it would have been done probably 10 seconds ago already. So whenever your content blocks change, whenever you're updating new content on your application, it's easy to get in and evolve your test so that you don't have to start from scratch and so that you can build reliability on that test and get a lot of mileage out of that test over time. Um, you'll see here both results were 100%, uh, everything passed. And actually in my log file here, we can see the overall result. Here's iteration one, the steps there, iteration two and the values that were used and all the passing steps there and of course the total time as well as each individual execution or iterations time too. So if you think about that, I can take that test up a, a lot by continuing through the application in the Spanish versus the English, or maybe expanding across even more languages, all with this one test, uh, just by either changing up the data source and adding maybe another row of language, um, or of course extending and adding onto this test as well. All right, so we're going to jump really quickly over to load testing. I went ahead, oh, before I do that, I do want to show you the ability here to right-click a test step, if need be, and edit and code. Uh, again, it's the last thing that we do in Test Studio, but we have a great built-in IDE for you. Uh, by clicking that, it will produce the code behind file, and we'll push some panels out of the way here real quick, because you can also see just how easy this is to work with. We do provide both the standalone environment that you've seen today, as well as a plugin for Visual Studio. So here you can see on the left side my virtually codeless test, except for this one step, and the coded step here as well. Okay, so you can get in here and extend and customize this. You can type in, there's an IntelliSense capability that's here, so you can easily create what it is that you need to do for your test step. Uh, so lots of ease of use, uh, IDE built in. You don't even have to have a Visual Studio installed to use Test Studio's IDE, it's already here for you. But if you do have the Visual Studio, you'll get the plugin uh, that comes with Test Studio as well. Okay, so great ease of use, minimal coding. Uh, but when you need it, it's easily to, uh, easy to access as well. All right, so as I mentioned, I'm gonna jump into a load test. Now load testing is great to see how your site, if your site's ready once it's, uh, once it's going live or, or on staging. Uh, Ultimately, it's probably best to do production load test when possible. But Test Studio allows you to leverage your existing tests. I'm going to run through real quick here and find some tests to work with. Just do this simple registration test. And we'll pick a browser. This will then execute the test, just to, as we've seen before, and return back any uh, data they found. Whoops, I grabbed the wrong test. But basically captures the traffic and it comes back with uh, all of the, first of all, dynamic targets that are detected. So any of the session IDs that we need to work with, uh, any of those that, things like authentication tokens that we need to interact with, Test Studio will detect. And you can disable these and enable these. Basically when you enable these, you're telling Test Studio to make them, to treat them as dynamic. If I uncheck these, this will actually be treated as static, which means each execution, each virtual user will reuse the same ID that's here. But by turning it on, I'm telling Test Studio that each virtual user needs to get its own. Here we have all of the posts and gets, and we can jump into the post operations and see that uh, we can data drive these as well. We could bring in a data source if we'd, if we'd like to, and maybe uh, provide the username and password so we can data drive our load scenarios. Once we've got our scenarios, we're gonna add our workload. So we may be adding a certain amount of workload to one versus another, varying those up. Uh, we'll put the majority here on this guy. 
and you've got performance monitoring. Performance monitoring is going to allow you to inspect the application's server, the app server that's hosting it, maybe the database server for the application to make sure that it's keeping up, uh, to check on memory or uh, physical disk processor. So we can add in some performance counters there and maybe even monitor multiple machines as well. On the right, we've got our strategy. So I'm going to ramp this up to 50 concurrent users uh, with a ramp at the beginning and run for three minutes first. Now, we can add more uh, profiles here. You don't just have to use our existing web test. You can also capture from a live browser or from APIs or from uh, mobile devices as well. And don't forget Test Studio Mobile as well as Test Studio API testing also is part of our ultimate package too. When you're ready to run your load test, you can set goals. And this allows you to basically sit back or sleep while it's executing and not have to uh, worry about it. And you're basically spelling out how, uh, what, what's required of the test for it to be considered a pass versus a fail. So we'll go ahead and run this test. And uh, we're going to run out of time as well, but uh, hopefully we'll get some result data back here in the next minute so that we could take a look at that. The maximum users of load is it's up to you. We've got customers that are test at, or load testing at hundreds of thousands of users, um, and then we've got some that are testing in the in the simple hundreds. Sometimes it depends on if it's a public-facing uh, application or if it's a, uh, a a local line of business application. Uh, as this is churning up here, we'll be able to start seeing average response time, current views, errors per second responses received per second, machine level variables as well. You can filter it down by machines that you're monitoring too. Uh, and we can watch as it progresses. I have a sample rate right now of every five seconds, so it's going to return data for me every five seconds. And I could even go run one of my functional tests or performance tests while the load test is running too. So you can combine these together. On the overview side, we're getting goals uh, reporting on here too, get some data back as well. And it tells us that we're currently not yet at our virtual user goal. Uh, we haven't had any errors yet. Our average response time is low and our responses received per second isn't quite where we want it yet either. We also have page specific metrics, which if there's any errors would give us the appropriate code and count and response time too. And if you'd like, you can get to all of your raw data at the bottom when you're done capturing it uh, with that export option. But it's better to just set the goals so that you don't have to worry about that. That's where we're going to end up leaving it off for today. Uh, again, I want to thank everyone. There's a lot of content that we cover in this session. Um, thank you for your time and attention. Feel free to re-watch uh, to, uh, to see this again in the video that we'll be providing in, in the follow-up email. And uh, any other questions that you might have, uh, feel free to contribute on the blogs as well. And uh, be, become a part of the community. If you don't already have a trial of Test Studio, you can get one. Do everything I've shown you today. We've also got some great examples out there and, and certainly can set up any private discussions that you might need and get you the appropriate pricing as well. But thanks again, everybody, for joining, and have a great day.